to speak to. Give us a conflict. Um, I'll just say that I've got a um, originally a suit conflict of interest or a reasonable conflict of interest. Good evening and welcome to the Bayside Local Planning Panel meeting for today. My name is Ross Bonthorn and I'll be chairing this meeting. I declare the public meeting open at 6.05. <coughs> As an introduction, the purpose of the Bayside Panel, the main panel is charged with considering planning proposals of any scale and value, determining development applications where the value is less than $30 million, and where there is potential conflict of interest. It is a contentious development, or there is a substantial departure from development standards, or it is a sensitive development. Mm. Council no longer considers these types of developments. In particular, the panel must consider development applications which have attracted 10 or more unique objections in a public meeting. Others can be considered outside of a public meeting. All decisions are published on Council's website, normally within two days, hopefully within two, two days. Live streaming. The public meeting is being recorded and is live streamed to the YouTube page. The recording is an official record of Council and may be made available to persons upon request in accordance with Freedom of Information Legislation and Information Public Access Act 2009. Applicants and members of the public who are registered to speak on an item will be asked to unmute their phone or computer at the relevant time to address the panel and to answer any questions. Alternatively, members of the public may have registered for the meeting by making a written submission which has been provided to all panel members. Once the panel has heard from all speakers, including applicants, we will either make a decision during the public meeting or adjourn to consider our decision. As previously mentioned, all decisions of the panel will be published on the website. Uh, I'd like to introduce the other panel members. Judy, if you would introduce yourself, please. My name's Judy Clark. I'm a registered planner. I've been in local government for over 35 years, managing planning functions, and I now have a, my own business. Thank you. Tony, if you could please. Um, my name's Anthony Reid. I'm a chartered professional engineer. I have over 35 years' experience as a local government director of engineering or general manager. And Peter? My name is Peter Cowder. I'm the 
a community representative on the planning panel. Uh, I do have formal planning qualifications, but um, relevant to my role, I've been a great planning resident of the Bayside area for over 30 years. Thank you. Uh, uh, my name is Ross Longton. I'm an architect planner. I formerly was a councillor with the City of Sydney and with Pitwater Council, which I was appointed by the then government to establish. Uh, I have been on several of these planning panels uh, and was for some 29 years the principal architect for the lend -Lease Group. And subsequently, having left lend -Lease years ago, I have been doing international and local planning and urban design projects throughout yeah. Australia and India and Asia. Acknowledgement of country. Bayswater Council acknowledges the traditional custodians, the Gadsdale and Vigigal people of the Eora Nation, and pays respects to elders past, present and emerging. The people of the Eora Nation, their spirits and ancestors, will always remain with our waterways and the land, our Mother Earth. Item number two, apologies. Are there any apologies? No, there are no apologies. Item number three, disclosures of interest. Uh, are there any disclosures of interest? Mr Chair, uh, I've declared uh, a reasonably perceived conflict of interest in relation to item 6.1 for uh, 179 Russell Avenue Do Dolls Point, so I won't be taking any part in the discussion or decision making on that item. Peter, thank you very much, and that will be noted. Uh, I believe there are no other. I have no conflict of interest. I have no conflict of interest. And I have no, and I think we've signed forms to that effect. Uh, item number four minutes of previous meetings 4.1 Bayside Local Planning Panel, 21st of March. 2023. Bayside Local Planning Panel notes that the minutes of the Bayside Local Planning Panel meeting held on the 21st of March 2023 have been confirmed as a true record of the proceedings by the chairperson of that meeting. Item 5 reports planning proposals. We have no planning tonight. Number 6 reports of public items. And we have, I believe, three public items. The first one is uh, 179 Russell Avenue, Dulles Point, and it's a modification application. And I believe we have the applicant. Mr. Bureau, I'll vacate the meeting. If you would, sir. So. Thank you. And again, yeah, that can be noted, please, that Mr. Carter has left the room. Um, Mr. Singh, do we have Mr. Singh on the line? Yes, we do, Mr. Singh. Thank you very much. Um, as you're aware, we have you can speak for three minutes. Uh, we'll give you a warning. I'm sorry, I meant by applicant that he wishes, Mr. Singh wishes to, to speak to the item. Uh, and I was just advising you, Mr. Singh, that you have three minutes and there'll be a warning for Bell to let you know. So if you would like to address the panel, please. Yeah, so, I'll just uh, request the panel to consider my application for DA modification. In regards to the changing change in timings of uh, coffee in the park, 179 Russell Avenue, Dolls Point, uh, from 10 a.m. Uh, opening to 8 a.m. opening in the morning. Oh, 10 a.m. Currently 10 a.m. Yes. Currently 10 a.m. To to be open at eight eight o'clock in the morning because it's uh, is in in the interest of the community because there's a it's in the sitting in the public park a lot of people come to the park for like jogging and walking and so so on and they do need all their like morning breakfast and coffees and stuff mm -hmm. and there's a school next to it uh, and uh, that school opens at eight thirty in the morning. Uh, a lot of parents comes to the school to drop the kids 
and they, they do need the breakfast for the kids and the coffees for themselves. Uh, yeah, that's about it. Thank you very much, Mr. Singh. We may have questions for you from some panel members later. In the interim, sure. is Mr. Sean Fogarty who wishes to address the be online. Mr. Fogarty? Yes, I am. Thank you. As you heard earlier, you have three minutes and we'll give you a little bell sound when uh, we would like you to wind up. Thank you very much. My apologies in advance. I've had a cortisone injection into my neck a couple of hours ago, so if I go too far off track, <laughs> uh, you can just cut me off. Um, I have multiple disabilities. I have lived across from the council property now for over 30 years, and I've previously, previously been involved uh, in a lot of different uh, planning matters for this area, including the current road mapping, the zigzag mapping, and a lot of other uh, issues on committees, panels, um, both with the police, the RTA, the ministers, the council, and a lot of different organisations. Uh, I'm aware of the 1995, I think, or 1996 DA application. I believe at the time I objected to that application. And at the time, council uh, itself um, also may have objected to a, an additional uh, increase in liquor licensing where the previous uh, tenants had applied for 24-hour liquor license for this cafe. Thank God that the council actually objected in the licensing court and that was knocked on the head. The hours were extended, however, for the Beat Hut restaurant until an absurd time of uh, up to 2 a.m. Uh, most days. And uh, at times uh, they have continued to operate. Now, maybe not perhaps under Mr. Singh, but over the years having lived here, it has not been good. The majority of people here uh, in uh, this area do not know the, the correct process to object. They don't know it. They didn't know that the, that the operations had actually been breaching their DA for so many years. I received a phone call and was speaking with the previous property manager for the council who advised that the council did want to push through this 8am to formalise what had been occurring for many years. Now, there's uh, a lot of materials that I've presented to the council. There's other materials that I've put in formal HIPAA applications to Fausto suit, and he's rejected the majority of them, unfortunately. The IPC, I believe they're called, wrote back to the council and stated that they believe the council was wrong in that. And one of those uh, GIP applications is currently under re-review. Now, I think the panel would need to ask why is the council itself not providing all of the materials on this property and not accepting uh, background materials from probably myself who had more information and knowledge of it than anyone at the council whatsoever. Um, the photos that I've presented there clearly show that in breach of the council issued notice to not operate before 10 a.m., the tenants have continued to do that since it was issued last year. And this has been the case for years. The compliance is one factor, but the issues of access, noise, illegal parking by patrons, by staff, delivery vehicles are serious. Now, I would request, and I'm more than happy to attend the site with any of the panel members, and I also made this request to the council, I can attend with you with mobility equipment, such as a wheelchair, a walker, a motor scooper, scooter, and I can show you how the access is blocked by the uh, non-compliant permanent umbrellas tables and chairs blocking. If you look at the plans very clearly, and it seems that no one ever did, there are some mobility bitumen ramps that were put in specifically because the previous DA application in about 96 raised the public footpath. So all of those outside tables and chairs are actually on what is a public footpath. Now, um, a lot of people don't know that. A lot of people think that the building is actually owned privately. It is not the case. So when it comes to things like access, noise, where the tables and chairs can go, 
where the tenants, where the delivery vehicles, where the staff themselves can park. These are relevant issues, even though someone's tried to slip this through as a modification and it's just an extension of hours. Mr. Now, do you mind that? My, my, my request is that I, I, I meet on site, more than happy to meet anyone on site, show them the issues in person and come to a reasonable solution. Now, I know that the council is preparing to knock the building down again in the materials that I presented to the council and dropped off on a US stick, including vast photos and other background materials. You can clearly see the ongoing daily breaches of the tenant, their staff and the operations. These are very, very serious matters. And as such, um, it's been escalated to other government departments as well. I believe that under the legislation, the panel and the council actually has to forward this through to the Minister of Planning because it is RE1 community land, crown land, and it is on a public reserve. So that's my closing. But love to meet anyone on site, show the issues and try and get it resolved because everyone does love a cafe. No problems about having a cafe there, but it's got to operate where it's not annoying neighbours, where it's not causing access for people with disabilities. My own mother is now in a permanent wheelchair years ago, tripped over the chain fence there directly next to the council, fell st straight onto her face, right? And then I took her up to Dr. Pater's uh, at Dolls Point, um, and then she went to the hospital and underwent uh, x-rays. That is still not fixed. The council painted it once with some white, then they put a, a reflective tape. All of that is off there. Why does it matter? It matters because the footpath was raised by the previous lease owners, which blocks access to the park. And that's why I included the Cook Park Plan of Management. And there's about 10 pages in that that specifically relate to what the council has to do for this property. The council has not been doing it at all. Thank you. Um, do any of the panel members have questions for either Mr. Fogarty or Mr. Singh? No, no questions. Um, Mr. Singh, you're aware that the application, the recommendation from staff is for it to be approved uh, and there will be recommendations for the conditions to be applied which relate to the compliance with existing food and beverage codes and applications. Are you aware of this? Yes, I'm completely aware of it. And and all these changes are related to the cafe only. Uh, it's got nothing to do with the with the restaurant. And the cafe itself doesn't have any any liquor liquor being served there or anything to do with the with the alcohol in the cafe. Thank you. Thank you both again for your time today. Uh, the panel will consider this this evening and notification will be available within hopefully 48 hours. It may take a little longer. So thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for your consideration also, Mr. Singh. Thank you. Item, so that's item 6.1. Item 6.2 is a modification for 35 Banks Avenue, Daisyville. There are a number of people who wish to speak in support of the recommendation by staff, which is for refusal. Um, and there are those who wish to speak against it. Um, we did meet with several of the people who have listed or have given us written submissions. There were a number of written submissions that all panel members have received, um, which are quite informative. And some of those uh, submissions, uh, as, uh, the people who have written them, have sought to address the panel. So I believe Nathan Brown, I think you were one of the people we met with this afternoon on site. Correct. So would you like to briefly please um, address your submission? We do have a written submission from you. Um, as we indicated, three minutes with the bell to give you a warning that we'd like you to wind up, please. Okay. 
Yep. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, panel, um, for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, it's it's my first time addressing a council panel. Um, so, look, I thank you for reviewing all of the development applications and public submissions and conducting on-site inspections. Uh, for context, I've lived in Bayside all my life, 43 years. I'm giving away my age and in Pagewood at my current house for 10 years. I've written four submissions uh, and raising what I believe genuine concerns regarding this development across all three DAs. Um, my family and I own a house. We live 100 metres from the fields and 350 metres with a direct line of sight to a new training facility. So I'm, I'm, I'm very affected by any activities on those fields. I've also got two children that attend the local schools in the direct area, one at Hartford, which is 160 metres from the development. And my youngest is at Daceyville Public School, which is 260 metres from the development. Um, I'm also the vice pres president of the PNC Association at Daceyville. Um, so I'm, I'm making this position with a, diff, a few different hats and not just as a, as a resident. Um, look, given that you've read all the public submissions and the officers' reports, I won't cover again all the public concerns raised in the submissions, but I'll just raise some key points and happy to take any questions. Thank you. Um, so key points, look, UNS. W. David Phillips Field has never been a major sporting precinct. Um, having lived across from the fields for 10 years, I've never had any issues with the general use of the university for, for university purposes, uh, nor have I ever lodged any complaints about the university activities on the field. And look, thanks for coming on site today. I think when you were there, when you look at the original layout, it, it's really a multi-purpose sports field, um, which was which was used infrequently during daylight hours during the weekdays, and rarely were all the fields used at the same time. Um, the fields have never had a general public address system. Uh, there's never been service of alcohol on the site, and I don't think there's ever been a public event on the site that would have exceeded 500 people. Um, the training facilities are obviously built. They're already in use by staff and players on a daily basis, and they are causing public uh, parking issues and traffic issues for residents and community members. The 75 council spaces in Astrolabe Car Park off Cook Avenue and the parking on Guay Avenue are now in really in default parking for the training facility. I think it's unfair to expect visitors to the aged care facility, students, parents, members of the church and the general community users of the park um, to drive and park potentially outside of the 400 metres of the site that the applicant wants to use for public game days and parking. Again, there, there's no direct public transport option. There's not a direct public transport option to this, sky, to this site. Um, the schools are well used outside of school hours with other community activities and on the weekends. And I think it's wrong to state that any noise from speakers on the weekend will have no impact to the schools and the communities that use them. I think it's un also unfair to um, subject the community potentially um, nearly every second weekend to having continuous background music and announcements made um, again from a field that has had no or limited noise um, really to date. Um, when the original DA was lodged, there was little community concern. I think given the applicant portrayed the development as only a training facility, and look, this is something that they now admitted was misleading and never the original intent of the project, and that was in reference to um, response 5A of their RFI response. And they also state that should public games be allowed, then it's really their expectation that speakers are appropriate for the site, uh, and I disagree. You can set in summary by adding public games and speakers, which which the applicant again has stated that they will continue to push for in the service of alcohol. This will have a huge effect on the surrounding residents and general public that use the surrounding parks and amenities. Mm. Um, the applicant has already started to use the facility for public games and publicised public games on the site. They've already installed some of the speakers without approvals that we're here to discuss tonight. They've really held the planning process and the community in contempt. Uh, in my opinion, and let's be honest, I think they're ready to go with public games and speakers. They're just waiting for you to catch up and approve it. Uh, you've been given two items to vote on with opposing recommendations from council officers. Um, so for, 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 for me to be clear, uh, regarding DA 2022 slash 164, I'm against opposed the council, the officer's recommendation in the report and ask the panel to vote against this DA. Regarding MDA-2022-71, I'm for in support the officer's recommendation in the report and ask the panel to vote against this MDA. And look, I thank you for your time again. Thank you. Does the panel have any questions? <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Not for me. No. Mr. Brown, thank you very much. I note that you also are listed to speak on the following item as well. And I also yeah. know Peter Carter has returned. I'm sorry I didn't acknowledge you, but you've been here for the whole of the discussion on this item. Correct. Thank you. Yes. That's confirmed. Um, we have other speakers who wish to address the panel. Um, and I have a list of, I think, eight names or representing the applicant and the consultants. It would be helpful if perhaps one person could be identified as the major speaker or someone that we can address rather than necessarily that with the full eight people actually speak. Yes. Uh, Chair, if, if that could potentially be me. Uh, Mr. Chair. Yes. Yep. Uh, so Michael Rowe speaking from Ethos Urban. Uh, I'm the planner on the project. Yes, thank you. And um, uh, as you're aware, obviously there is a modification and a DA uh, that's been lodged for this site, and it it probably does make sense to, um, given the crossover, to to speak to both of them at the same time and deal with them in uh, if with your leave. I guess is the most orderly manner in which that we do talk to them. Um, but you may also be aware that we provided further correspondence to Council in relation to making amendments to the modification and the main DA to effectively move the speakers into the main DA, uh, given that the Council's uh, mm. health officer supported the acoustic impacts of the speakers, but Council had issue with it being substantially the same development. Uh, and was that correspondence provided to you? Six of yes. 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 Uh, so I'm not sure how the panel intends on dealing with that in light of this, but it would the implication would be that uh, we would be asking that the modification be approved, which deals with the signage uh, and uh, the hours of operation. Uh, and that uh, if council is supportive of the the speakers, that they also be incorporated into uh, our request as an amended DA for the public games to allow you to deal with it all in one place and avoid uh, what could effectively be a, an unnecessary further modification to come back and, and seek the speakers. And I appreciate around process that you would want you know, full consideration of the speakers, but given that these applications have run concurrently, have been publicly exhibited uh, at the same time and assessed at the same time, and the public have obviously had an opportunity to speak at this panel at the same time uh, from a process perspective, uh, I think it's something that the, the panel could uh, consider to avoid having to do a further modification. Um, are there any questions of Mr. Rowe? Right. I've spoken, I guess, from the technical. Sorry, just before you continue at this stage, are there any questions for, from the panel to Mr. Rowe? Not for me. No, I'm sorry. So, Mr. Rowe, if you would like just to continue for a little longer or to extend. I, we've, we've got our um, technical experts here to field questions from the panel in relation to acoustics and traffic and, and myself from a planning perspective, but um, representatives of New South Wales Rugby would like to talk, uh, use, uh, I guess, their allotted time just to help the panel understand why this project is important um, and, and how it forms part of the, the broader centre of excellence. Uh, so uh, it might be appropriate for them to talk, and then if the panel has questions of the broader team on New South Wales Rugby, uh, we could return to that after they've had their opportunity. Sure. So would that be Mr Green or Mr Blades or Mr Dorn? Uh, Mr Dorn, if, if, Paul, if you want to unmute. Yeah, sorry. That'd be, uh, that'd, I'd, I'd love to speak if that's okay. So I'm the Chief Executive Officer for New South Wales Rugby and also the Chief Executive Officer for New South Wales Waratahs. Thank you. Yes. 
So I think from our perspective, one of the things I would like to clear up, I think is a miscommunication or a misunderstanding in particular to the definition of public games. Um, the New South Wales Rugby Centre of Excellence is, is in fact the headquarters for all of New South Wales rugby's operations for the state of New South Wales. That includes from a community perspective all the way through to the elite uh, teams that play on the international stage, being the men's and women's teams. I want to be super clear, the intent for us as an organisation is to be able to have a, a community access to being able to play public games on that facility, not for our elite teams to be playing professional or ticketed or large crowd events um, at that particular event. We play in the government owned tier one and tier two stadia, which have got all the facilities that you are required for those sorts of events and the crowd sizes. The indication I think from your site walk today with the fact that we've got 146 seats in this very small grandstand should give you an idea of the sense of the size of the crowds that we're looking to play on this particular side. Those crowds and those games are actually very consistent with what we've played on that site for the last five years since we've been in Demountables directly opposite uh, opposite uh, on uh, Banks Avenue, uh, Banks Avenue uh, on the other side of the field. So from our perspective, We've listened to the concerns from the planning assessment from the council and also from the community and actually in our resubmission we've reduced the number of events that we'd like to be considered as public games and we've also reduced the size of those games uh, the size of the audiences attending those games so uh, it is very consistent with what's happened in the past not just in the five years that we've been here but but in the last 60 years that the University of New South Wales has been operating sports games on that particular site. So again, from our perspective, our public games are much more around community-based access where we're trying to provide access to grassroots players and some smaller or aged representative teams that actually would just would love to have the excitement and the delight of playing on the same training field and using the same facilities that our elite men and women will play. So from our perspective, I just want to just clear, clarify in particular um, what that looked like from a public games perspective. Very consistent with what's happened in the past, and it's certainly not our big major professional games, which are ticketed events, which are held in other stadiums across the city of New South Wales, by well, the city of Sydney. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other speakers that um, would like to address the panel briefly? Through you, Chairman, we have one um, objector who's... Um, We'll speak. Mrs. Robin Jorbeck is for a refusal. I'm sorry, thank you. I had missed that. That was not listed for me. Um, <laughs> anyway, so Robin Gilbert, yes. I, do we have Ms. Gilbert on the line? Yes. Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry, Paul. I apologise. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. If you proceed. Um, my name is Robin Gilbert. I'm speaking from the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I pay my respects to elders past and present. Uh, I lived in Isaac Smith Street, Daisyville for 10 years, and I still regularly walk my dog in Astrolabe Park and visit friends in Daisyville. And I'm also secretary of the Friends of Astrolabe Park. And I love the peace and quiet of Daisyville. And I want to talk about the noise impacts of the two development applications before the planning panel tonight. I support the officer's recommendation to refuse approval for the PA system, and I disagree with the recommendation for conditional approval for public games. My house was 450 metres from David Phillips Field, and sometimes on a still night, I could stand in my backyard and hear the shouting of the rugby players training at David Phillips Field. I didn't mind that noise, but you can be sure that any amplified music or announcements would be heard across all of Daisyville and we're opposed to that. It's not consistent with what's happened in the last 60 years and we don't think it should be happening now. The proponents acoustic report found that the predominant noises in Daisyville were low traffic, wildlife noise, light foot traffic and children playing. And that's how we like it. It's a quiet suburb surrounded by golf courses and parks. Many of us work from home or live in the aged care facilities or attend school in the area. Daisyville residents aren't like those people who move next door to a live music venue and then campaign to shut it down. Daisyville has always been a quiet neighbourhood. People do come to play sport, but it's not spectator sport. There's no drinking alcohol and there's no amplified noise. Now New South Wales rugby have moved in and they say it is a sporting precinct. It's normal to have noise and crowds, but it's not normal for Daisyville. 
We don't need a 15 month trial. New South Wales Rugby have gone ahead with nine public games already held in breach of their conditions. And this amounts to an informal trial of public games. Residents have already reported in their submissions that the cheering and shouting is significant, even with low numbers. One resident who lives very close to the field said that attendees screaming and shouting, booing and cheering, singing and chanting during the weekend and evenings till past 11 p.m. Some of the events proposed are not just two hour rugby games, but for example, the New South Wales School Championships is three games per day over three days in a row. The plan of management recommends signage to remind visitors not to create excessive noise, but the proponents haven't managed to control the excessive noise created during their unauthorised trial period. So we have no expectation that noise will be controlled, particularly once the sale of alcohol begins. Finally, Daisyville community is sick of responding to these DAs. The officer's recommendation of conditional approval means that we will have to respond to another application in 12 months time. And of course, well, we were expecting another application for a PA system, but now it seems it's being slid into tonight's development application, which doesn't seem correct at all. There must be a limit to public energy spent considering these applications. We consider the PA system is an absolute no. It's it's really um, beyond the pale and, and can't be allowed. The sale of alcohol is completely intolerable and uh, the noise impacts of public games is intolerable. And there's other speakers tonight that are going to talk about the traffic impacts. So thank you for the opportunity to speak to the panel. Thank you, Ms. Gilbert. Do any of the panel members have questions or no. comments at this stage? No. So are there any other speakers for this item as opposed to 6.3, which is linked, obviously? Are there any other speakers for 6.2? Uh, Mr. Chairman, can I just ask a process question? Yes. Um, I, I just want to, is there an opportunity for us to uh, refute yeah. The allegations about this, uh, the the nine public games that have been played. Is there a chance for us to set the record straight on that because that's uh, incorrect? Sure. Um, I'm not sure what Miss Gilbert's uh, referring to in relation to the to the unauthorised trial. We've we've been we've held no public games on the facility. There are a number of other games that have occurred on David Phillips Sports Field Number One, which is through done through the university, not part of our our DA request. We have not. Um, use the, the PA system at all for any uh, activities to date. Um, so I'd like to just say that that's completely incorrect. And the other one for us is is just to be clear around the use of the PA systems based on our safety and our, our systems and processes. It's, it predominantly relates to emergency procedures, but also game day scoring and announcing of scores, not for the music uh, to be bled out at all times of the, the day or night. So I just want to set the record straight um, from the unauthorised trial perspective, because that's just uh, not correct. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Is there any comment further from panel members? I'd like to ask a question. By all means. Can, I, is Michael, can Michael Rowe, are you able to answer a question? Uh, hopefully. Yeah, good. Michael, have you, you've had the benefit of reading the report on the modification application? Uh, that's right, yes. Um, is it, can you just confirm with me that all the signs that you're seeking approval for have already been erected? Because in the report it says there are two new signs and some amendments to go ahead. Um, are the new signs already up? No, as far as I'm aware. Okay, because I think we saw some of them today being already up. So I just wanted if you were aware There's, of that. There is signage that was always approved as part of the DA. And then this is additional. So did you see, it may have been signs that were already a part of the approved signage. No, these were the, the two new signs. It appears that they might already have been erected. Yeah, I, I can't, sorry, I can't comment. All right, that's fine, thank you. And the speakers have been installed, I think we saw speakers there today. Yes, yes. thank you. Yes. yes. So the recommendation from off of the officers is that this be reviewed. It's, Sorry, just to um, clarify, the speakers are there for emergency. So there's a PA system that's there for emergency purposes. That's what those speakers relate to. Um, 
that's why. So it's not that the illegal works have been done. It's the fact that they always had to have speakers in that emergency situation. If that's and, helpful for the panel. And the request for the hours of operation to change, does that mean that they would then be the same as the remainder of the facilities that are there? That's correct. Thank you. Um, I think at this stage I may move to the next item 6.3 because there is obviously an interrelationship. And on that basis, I don't know if you wish to speak to that, Mr. Rowe, or someone else. Uh, I, I don't think we have anything further to add to what we raised um, before. Paul, I don't know if you would wanted to add anything further. No, nothing further at this stage. OK, so then for Mr. Brown, did you wish to have, add anything further? Yeah, look, sorry, I thought I was only get, going to get three minutes on both. Uh, oh. so I, can, I, can, I can reread my, my previous points. Um, Look, in relation to public games on field one or field two, um, I, I respect that obviously um, uh, the Waratahs were oper operating a temporary facility on the Banks Avenue side of the field um, and had training there. They then moved when the building was obviously given the green light into the training facility. Irrespective of whether they were using training field one or training field two, I think that they've just stated that they've been having public events on the fields, whether it's UNSW, which they were temporarily temporarily uh, occupying or their current field. I think, you know, again, we've had public games on, on the fields. Um, in relation to the speakers, I, I, I just don't comprehend how, and I can't remember the number of speakers because I was just on site for the first time today, but I think it's, 11 of the 16 have been installed in, in a highly concentrated area. I think, you know, one every couple of metres, how that constitutes um, speakers um, relevant to just emergency requirements at this stage. Um, so, yeah, I'll just make those two points in, in reply to some of the positions that have been made. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other speakers? Yes, there is listed there are several others miss amanda wilson do we have miss wilson uh, yes i'm here thank you very much um shall i start yes three minutes and a bell okie doke um so i've lived in daisyville for 23 years in isaac smith street within spitting distance of um david phillips field and over the years, you know, walking dogs and installing a street library and being someone who likes to chat, I've met a, a really large number of my neighbours. Uh, so, and I therefore, you know, was dobbed in as president of um, our local community group, uh, Friends of Astrolabe Park. Uh, and so I wish to speak to you tonight uh, in that capacity about the benefit versus burden on our community of this uh, DA for public games at David Phillips Field. We formed the association in 2018 in response to the um, well-founded fear that Daisyville residents and park users were sitting ducks for well-funded and influential sporting groups eyeing off Astrolabe Park. Now the community has become a bit of a community hub. And when I say community, I'm referring to ours, um, which is very diverse. And I think one of my neighbours will speak a bit more about the diversity later. But the one thing we all have in common is that we are not the community that Rugby New South Wales refers to in all of the documentation you will have read. If I can just tell you a brief story, one of my neighbours decided that the best thing to do would be to visit David Phillips Field, have a friendly chat about his concerns. And, and everyone was polite and he was introduced to the um, community officer who seemed really confused. Uh, he didn't understand why someone from the community was objecting, he hadn't heard about any DAs and he had no idea that the local community was upset. And he admitted that his, in, his job involved the rugby community. So there's really clear difference between that word the way we use it and the way the proponent uses it. And I think you need to keep that in mind if you, you know when you're considering this. Um, also, when considering your decision, I hope you'll reflect on this idea of benefit versus burden for, for our community. So if I could just outline the, 
the proponent has benefited already to the tune of, uh, I don't know, $250 million in taxpayers' funds in that they received to build the training facility. They benefit from an agreeable arrangement with the University of New South Wales, who benefited originally from the receipt of this land from Sydney Water through Council for the purpose of student sporting activities. They benefit from having um, professional facilities which they now seek to profit from by offering the boardroom for corporate events and they seek to benefit from running paid spectator events and selling alcohol in a location completely unsuitable for such activities. They benefit from promoting our little suburb of Daceville as the home of rugby in New South Wales, as if they're doing residents a favour. So what's proposed is in fact a huge and inappropriate burden on our community in Daceville. Rugby claims that Daceville is already a sporting precinct. Well, that's not the case. It's a heritage residential suburb designed to be a little island of green and quiet. The fact that uni students have played sport at the field for many years has never ever been a cause for complaint. Other speakers are, are, are going to talk about noise and parking and traffic, and thanks, um, Nathan, for your comments. Um, residents will be shouldering the burden of policing a trial period for public games if you permit it. The idea that locals are supposed to be vigilant for however long this trial period is, is unacceptable. The proponents request to sell and serve alcohol to spectators at public games represents a burden on residents. The suggestion that inebriated spectators who are behaving badly would be ejected into the streets of Daceville is all burden and no benefit for us. The sound from public address speakers is a huge burden, and I know that um, that this may well now be considered as part of this, which was a bit of a surprise to us. Um, we were didn't have the benefit of receiving all of the documents in plenty of time. Um, and then the burden of DA creep on our community is already taking a toll. People, people are exhausted by it, especially the older residents who don't understand what's going on. They may not be digitally literate enough to be able to navigate the council's website and things like that. So to be on the lookout for another DA coming at some point from the U rugby and the uni just feels like a cynical tactic as far as we're concerned. So I would like to wrap this up by asking you to decide against this DA on the basis that Rugby New South Wales already benefits enormously from its training facility. If they need to, they can access many other appropriate locations, as Mr Dawn has already said. This is our home. If you don't decide, if you do not decide against this DA, the burden on residents, the only community that really should matter here, will be far too great. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Uh, do we have Natasha, sorry, Natalia Levan? Yes, present. Yeah, if you'd like to address the panel, please. You have three minutes and we'll give you a little warning bell at the end of three minutes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I live in Daisyville, about 100 metres from David Phillips Field. I'm a mother of two children. One of them attends Daceville Public School. My partner and I both work from home during the day. First, it is important to understand that when Rugby New South Wales speak about community, they're not referring to local residents or families who use Astrolic and Roland Parks. They're not referring to us, they're referring to the rugby community. I'm very worried that in proposing to reject the NDA 413 public address speakers, council officers have suggested that if the DA for public events at the rugby training facility is approved, then the proponent can lodge separate DA for speakers. It is worrying and very confusing because we know that speakers have already been installed without approval. So sometimes it feels like lodging a successive DAs and modification is Rugby New South Wales's game plan, and that is highly stressful for the community. Let me tell you about the people who will be impacted if the DA for public events is approved. According to the most recent census, which is in 2021, some 40% of the civil residents are aged over 65. More than 30% are from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. Some 7% are of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, which is higher than the average 3%. Um, but in Australia. 
At least 15% have profound or severe need of assistance. Around 70% live in social housing. And this is a very important point to note because many are frightened to object or complain because real or imagined, they fear that speaking out will cause them to be evicted from their homes. Some 20% of the day civil community work in public safety, healthcare, and social assistance. These areas often require shift work and rest is critical for these people to ensure they can conduct their jobs safely and prevent catastrophic accidents. This is a community more likely to engage in passive recreation. Allowing rugby New South Wales to use its training facility as professional sports racing for paid public events will do nothing to improve the amenity of the people of Daisyville. In fact, it is more likely to destroy it. The proponent claims that this EA will provide a business or social service that benefits the local community and contributes to the vitality of the area. I dispute that claim. Increased traffic, parking issues and noise do not constitute vitality. The neighborhood already has a lively village atmosphere with regular social interactions facilitated by the unique heritage design of Daisyville. Centric for the proponent argues that a majority of public games will be played on weekends when there are no school classes, therefore noise won't be an issue. That claim is denying the impact weekend noise will have on the local community who expect peaceful enjoyment of their homes and the parks in the area. Even without loudspeakers, currently the noise from games and training can already be heard in our homes with the windows closed. An increase in the number of spectators will increase the noise level and the distance it travels. Extending the opening hours will reduce the amount of quiet rest time for the residents. The proposal to sell alcohol to attendees at public games is completely unacceptable. The management plan suggests moving drunks out of the venue and into surrounding streets. How is that going to benefit the community? It's also unacceptable that a trial period of public events was even suggested when it's the community who will be unfairly burdened with the task of policing and submitting complaints. This proposal only protects and benefits the New South Wales rugby community, but not the local community. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Are there any other speakers? I don't have any others listed. There are no others. Do panel members have any questions? Or I guess uh, I would ask Michael Rowe if Michael, you would like a very brief response to some of the comments you've heard. Yes, thank you, Chair. I, I think there's something that's really important as an overarching response as part of what the community's expressed about <coughs> the um, impact on them. And that's to recognise that this land is zoned for this purpose as, as RE2 private recreation. Um, and land available for this type of use is, is scarce in Sydney. Um, and we, we have um, this as a, a pocket of RE2 that sits in part of a much bigger part of a regional uh, recreation area. And that that area, you know, provides a role that is far more um, regional in its purpose than the immediate neighbourhood. In the same way that the golf course, the residents in this local area um, may not be uh, golfers, um, but they, the golf course provides an amenity to um, a much bigger area of people as a role of regional recreational space. So um, the role of the panel ultimately without, you know, telling you what you have to do as your jobs is, is evaluating that this definitely does have very direct community benefits. Um, there are obviously localised impacts that come with the development. There's a framework in which um, council has assessed those impacts around the acoustic, uh, what's considered acceptable from acoustic point of view and from a traffic perspective. Uh, and the in, the evidence base of which sits behind that in terms of uh, technical assessment uh, supports what we're proposing here, and council has supported that assessment. So it's really about un, uh, appreciating that this actually does have a regional role and that it does have regional benefits, and that through the evidence-based assessment that's gone on, uh, it's supportive of what's being proposed here in what's been developed in conjunction with council. Uh, so the only other one comment I wanted to add was uh, the the, P, the speaker system was approved as part of the DA, uh, the, the original DA, um, and it was for the purposes originally of the intention that there would be the public service announcements, even though it also has a dual purpose from an uh, emergency perspective. Um, so. Rugby have approval for the erection of those speakers as part of that consent. That consent then had a condition that limited their use for the purposes of the PA system, which is why we put the application in, in the first place. Thank you. Do panel members have any questions of 
Mr. Rowe, or any comments? No. Um, sorry. I've got a question for Mr. Rowe. So are you saying the, the speakers were approved because they were on an approved plan? That, that's that, as I understand it, I haven't had a chance to go back and check them, but that they were approved as part of the original DA. Because they've got a condition saying they can't use them. Condition and consent, I think. Yes. Restricted the use of the PS. Yes. Yeah. Um, original consent, I think, was processed under DA 2020. Four five five one, and it had uh, conditions of consent restricting the use of the PA. Yeah. Yeah. Specifically, yeah. right. So, uh, and also, I think very relevant is the original approval was for a training facility. Full stop. That, that's not uh, our position on it, um, and it was in the original plan of management that went with the DA that um, it was it, in within that document. Even uh, it was suggested that there would be public games. It was this was about it being the centre and the home of rugby New South Wales. Obviously, the training facility is a, a key component of that, um, but it, it was. Uh, always part of the intent uh, for rugby for this to be used more broadly for the community. Not a part of the consent. Certainly, maybe and, in your view, not part of the consent. And and that's that's why we have lodged a DA because the consent was clear in that public games oh. weren't part. Of it. We've lodged the DAs to get the consent for it to become a broader facility than a training centre. That that's correct. So in it's your own words, a regional. At 6.3. Mm. Uh, in the correspondence, Mr. Rowe, in the correspondence from your office, I think it was signed by Jethro Ewan, there was a suggestion that you wished to amend the uh, material in 6.2 and particularly to move consideration of the speakers from 6.2 to 6.3. Is that what you're seeking to do? That That's correct. So how do you see that that amendment could be incorporated and or processed? Well, we wrote to council uh, seeking to amend the modification. So that would be to delete the, com the speaker's component of that modification. Clause 21. And then from then move the speakers into the public, amend the public games DA to then include the speakers as part of that approval. Uh, now, yes. the intent of that was to avoid, given that council had indicated that it was supportive from an acoustic perspective, but not from a substantially the same development perspective, the intent of that uh, the request was to avoid having to do an unnecessary modification. We've heard the community obviously have um, application fatigue, and given that both applications have been con exhibited, considered um, concurrently, the community have had an opportunity to speak to it. It seemed like there was uh, it procedurally um, would be uh, in everyone's interest to, if the, the panel was supportive of the, the PA system to include it in that application and save a further application. How would you see that being included? Well, we have a live DA, and so we have the ability to amend that DA up until the point of determination um, to include the PA system as part of it. With council's agreement. Yeah, with agreement from council. That's correct. So effectively, it's a different DA than we presently are considering in 
So, sorry, you did just break up there, but yes, to include but it within 6.3. It would mean yep. 6.3 is a different application than the one we currently have in front of us and the material that the panel has been given. Well, it would be in in the sense that it, it includes the um, PA system, which is part of the modification at the moment. Nothing fundamentally is different between in terms of the documentation that's been provided. But if it's not something that the panel feels comfortable with doing, then um, then we're happy to uh, accept that that's, those amendments aren't uh, accepted by the council and move forward with the material that's in front of you. But, but we would still seek to delete the PA system from the modification just to allow for the signage and hours which I don't think are controversial to move forward. Thank you. So are there any other questions or comments that panel members have? Yes. Um, Mr. Rowe mentioned about the golf course, the adjacent golf course. I would like to add that golf is not noisy, doesn't require flood speakers, has high decibel flood speakers and the golf courses are far away from the residential areas. Thank you. Thank you. So if there's no further comment from the panel, just an observation. The panel obviously consider item 6.2 and 6.3. And I, at a personal level, I guess I'm cognizant of the comments made from the residents, particularly relating to traffic, traffic management, to parking, to the way in which the numbers would be affected, spectators would be policed, uh, the acoustics. I think there are a number of things which we as a panel will need to consider in determining items 6.2 and 6.3. So if that's the case, I will close discussion on those two items. And this concludes the public component of the meeting. I declare this public meeting closed at 7.04. The live streaming will also cease at this point. And thank you all for your time and attendance tonight. Uh, the committee, the panel will consider this and there will be a resolution available within hopefully 48 hours. Thank you. Thank you very much, panel.